One of the North Carolina Zoo's roles and one of its most important missions is saving wild species and the places they live. Within the Caribbean, there are a lot of islands and each one of those islands has a great amount of biodiversity. So biodiversity is important everywhere, but when you're talking about island populations, like in Puerto Rico, they're even more important because so many of these species are found nowhere else in the world. So I've been working with the Puerto Rican Crested Toad for over 15 years now, and more recently, since I've been in North Carolina Zoo, we've gone from not even having the Puerto Rican Crested Toad to now we keep the toad, we breed the toad, we send tadpoles back to the wild, and we also have staff come down to Puerto Rico multiple times a year to help with site surveys and population surveys. Our ultimate goal is to work with other zoos and have enough genetic diversity to have a population last for 100 years. Anyone that's ever been to Puerto Rico knows that Puerto Ricans have pride in their island and the heritage and all of the species that occur there. But sadly, most Puerto Ricans don't even know what the Puerto Rican Crested Toad is because it is so rare and it is so hard to find. Many of the Puerto Ricans that we work with, specifically with the Crested Toad, take significant pride in the species because they've been one of the lucky few that have not only been able to see it in the wild, but they've been able to help us with this work to save the species. The Puerto Rican Crested Toad program is one of the many conservation projects that we are involved with at the North Carolina Zoo. So we're working specifically with the Puerto Rican Crested Toad because it is an endangered species and it is a species in which we can actively breed them at the zoo and send tadpoles back to the wild and help the populations recover. So this is our Puerto Rican Crested Toad room. All of the animals that are in here will be bred and the offspring will be released back in the wild. And so in order to keep the wild population safe from any potential diseases that we could bring in, we keep everything as clean, as quarantined, as sterile as possible. As part of the quarantine process, we change gloves between every single toad habitat. We put on boots and we are not allowed to work with any other amphibians before we come into this room. It gets disinfected once a month to ensure that there's no diseases, bacteria, fungus, or anything. I have here um, a male and a female Puerto Rican Crested Toad. Both of these individuals are about five years old. Males are smaller. They kind of have this yellowish hue in their body and that color gets brighter and brighter during the breeding season. There's one other way of telling, and that is by the nuptial pads. And the nuptial pad is just inside their inside digit on their limb, and that little black dot, if you live in North Carolina or anywhere in the US, any of the toads you find in your backyard, they'll usually have nuptial pads during breeding season. And this female, she's pretty big along her sides. You can see she might look like she has a little bit of extra weight, but in reality, those are actually eggs that are already starting to develop. Puerto Rican Crested Toads need a healthy environment. They need a very healthy ecosystem to survive. They need a breeding pond that holds enough water for a long enough period of time for them to reproduce successfully. And they also need to have a good upland, a good environment to where they're gonna go live for most of the year when they're not breeding. Cause they only breed once a year or sometimes only every couple years. The Puerto Rican Crested Toad actually relies on hurricanes and other significant tropical storms every year for breeding events that hurricanes can still have a negative impact on them by disturbing the trees and the vegetation and making it harder for the toad to survive. So because of this concern for population declines and habitat loss, zoos around the United States, Canada, and our partners in Puerto Rico developed new populations. So more ponds were built throughout the island. Each one of these sites typically has a release pond, and those release ponds are completely covered with mesh to keep predators out. And then they're also accompanied with a breeding pond. So these ponds act very, very similar to natural breeding ponds in Puerto Rico. They fill with significant rain events, but they also dry to keep these ponds temporary. The last natural breeding pond in Guanaca Dry Forest was once used as a parking lot, unfortunately, but since then it has been completely protected and the site has been partially restored and there's even now a boardwalk so that locals can still access the area and access the beach, but they won't have a negative impact on the toads when they breed there. Well, on this trip, we were lucky enough to participate in a release. And not only were we releasing tadpoles that were bred in zoos in the United States, but we also released toadlets, which are little tiny baby toads. Transporting toads is actually pretty simple. The tadpoles are packaged up in bags with oxygen. They're put into insulated foam coolers so that they are comfortable while they're making their long journey back to Puerto Rico. 
So after picking these toads up from FedEx, we had to go through and sort all the toads because we were conducting a research project. We wanted to learn more about how they would survive and what they would do once they were released. This information will let us get a better understanding of what these wild release toads are doing, how far they're moving, how they're surviving, maybe even what sort of habitat they're preferring. Before marking or tracking any of the toads, the first thing we did was tested both of these methods at zoos in the United States. That way we can watch the toads to see how they respond to either technique and make sure everybody was safe. So the toads that were tracked were tracked using a harmonic device that basically beeps or shows us the intensity on the screen as we get closer to the toad. The majority of the toads were marked using a non-toxic fluorescent powder. This gives us the ability to track these toads for a few days at nighttime using a black light. And it's a very, very non-invasive way of tracking an animal's movement because not only can you find toads that have already been marked, but you can also kind of see a trail of where they went. So the next night after releasing all of the toadlets, we went back to follow them. We were not only able to find toads, but we were actually able to track some of their movements based on following powder on the ground. One of the best takeaways from this particular trip is that we were able to track quite a few toads that had moved hundreds and hundreds of meters, which was a bit of a surprise. We know that they can move fairly long distances as adults, but I don't think we were expecting little tiny toads that had just been released to move, you know, three, four, five hundred meters, or even more than that in just one night. So the reason this toad is endangered is truly because of habitat loss and degradation and other impacts have come from invasive species. Invasive species are a non-native species that come into an environment, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, and they have a negative impact on the ecosystem. Marine toads have a variety of impacts on the Puerto Rican crested toad. Uh, they will not only displace them by eating the food that the Puerto Rican crested toad would like to eat, but they will physically eat the Puerto Rican crested toad. That's how big these guys are. While we were looking for toads, we also found a giant marine toad that was sitting right in the middle of the release site. As soon as I grabbed the toad, I called everybody over to see a really large marine toad, and upon further inspection, Oh, look at his face! We realized that he had some of that same fluorescent powder on our toads all around his mouth. Marine toads are definitely the biggest threat to Puerto Rican crested toads of all of the invasive species. So for us, one of the biggest measurements of success is finding toads. During this trip, we were lucky enough to find baby toads, toadlets, that were actually not released by us. So we know that the toads at this site were breeding, which is hugely important. We also look for sites every year or two and build more ponds. It's flat right here. Move it. It goes back. We need to have more populations of crested toads for it to be considered recovered. Most of our conservation programs at the zoo are supported through Zoo Society, and most of that fund comes from memberships, donations. We also have to apply for grants to pay for most of these programs as well. But what you may not know is every time you visit the zoo, you help support our conservation programs, which help save species like the Puerto Rican Crested Toad. Through our efforts and partnerships, there is hope to save all of the species that we're working to protect. It's why we're here and we love what we do. Get that? <laughs> <laughs> Except for bugs. <laughs> We partner with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the Puerto Rican Department of Natural Resources and we have many, many, many uh, NGOs or non-government organizations that we partner with on both the northern and the southern portions of the island and that is how we do most of our field work as well as most of our releases in Puerto Rico and that has led to the success of the program.